Welcome to the Sunrise session titled, Turning to Technology, Reducing Pressure Injury Incidents in Critical Care with Turn Cueing. My name is Anne-Marie Cooley and I'm the Medical Education Manager at Smith & Nephew for Pressure Injury Prevention, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to encourage everyone to take this survey about the kind of pressure injuries that we have been seeing during COVID-19 surges in different parts of the country. This survey is being conducted in collaboration with New York University, Rutgers University, and Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'll be showing this QR code at the end of the talk as well, so you'll be able to scan that. I encourage everyone to participate, and thank you very much in advance. So what we know about hospital-acquired pressure injuries is that although other hospital-acquired conditions are actually going down, we've done a great job reducing them. Adverse drug events are down, cauties, clapsies, all of these quality initiatives that we've been seeing in hospitals over the years are really paying huge dividend in reducing these um, unfortunate hospital-acquired conditions. However, in terms of hospital-acquired pressure injuries, they are still on the increase. And the last government data shows they increased 6% compared to an average decrease of 13% across all other hacks. How, what these also are is very expensive to treat. So more than $21,000 of unreimbursed treatment costs per pressure injury and more than nine increased hospital stay a days and an increased likelihood of that patient being readmitted back to the hospital. There's also a large correlation between hospital-acquired pressure injuries and other hospital-acquired conditions. So a patient who develops a HAPI is two times as likely than, a, uh, than any other hospitalized patient to experience a fall during their stay. They're three times more likely to have a urinary tract infection, four times more likely to develop a VTE, and five times more likely to develop a ventilator-associated pneumonia. Now, we've been repositioning patients literally since Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War. And uh, honestly, where Q2 came from, it really took her nurses two hours from the beginning of the war till the end of the war to reposition everyone. It literally is the oldest intervention that we know for pressure injury prevention. What we know, however, is that this is a task that is easily um, it's easy to forget to do that simply because the clinical environment is so busy and nurses are so task saturated. What various different studies show is that adherence to um, the turning protocols is low, somewhere around 50%. And in fact, it tends to be lower in critical care than it is in uh, medical surgical or general floors. We also know from research that there's a great amount of variability in care and repositioning based on time of day. For example, a night shift is uh, much more likely to have a lower adherence to turn protocol than, for example, morning or afternoon shift. And male patients are turned less frequently than female patients, and patients with high, high BMI are turned less frequently than patients with low BMI. So as a solution for this issue, a leaf patient monitoring system was developed. And what the system is, it consists of a wearable sensor that patients wear on their chest like a sticker. And it is wirelessly transmitting information from the sensor into the user interface that is then displaying the patient's status and orientation and activity in and out of bed in silent color-coded cues that allow staff to uh, basically prioritize their tasks, who needs to be turned, and uh, manage that activity uh, better. I'm now going to show a brief video on how this system works. At the core of the LEAF system, is the wireless wearable patient sensor. The single patient use device weighs less than an ounce, is waterproof, and has a battery life of up to 16 days. When placed anywhere on the patient's upper anterior torso, the sensor automatically begins monitoring the patient's position and activity, regardless of whether they are lying in bed, sitting upright in bed, sitting upright in a chair, or moving about. 
The sensor communicates wirelessly through a proprietary mesh network to centralized monitors that display the patient's current position and visually alert staff when repositioning is needed. This display helps staff identify and prioritize who needs to be turned and when. All right, so what the system is, is actually it's uh, much more sophisticated than just a timer. You may have seen, I mean, we've been using timers forever, right? Oven timers, uh, we have paper clocks, uh, musical cues, all those kinds of things. But this really allows individualized care to be provided for each patient. It's not only looking at that turn frequency, but also the adequacy of the turn, making sure that the patient is repositioned enough to offload the sacral area, which really is what we're trying to do to prevent pressure injuries. And in addition to that, it's also looking at tissue recovery time in between patient repositioning events so that if a patient has a very transient short duration turn on their side and returns back supine, we're not going to grant them another two hours or three hours in that position before we reposition them again. The system has been shown to significantly increase turning uh, and repositioning frequency and protocol adherence. So on average to over 90% from various different studies. Um, in a study conducted in a large medical surgical floor, um, the blinded baseline showed a turn adherence of 64%, which increased to 98%. And the findings were also similar in a subpopulation of um, isolated patients. It's also been shown to reduce that variability in care delivery that we talked about earlier. And most importantly, it's been shown to significantly reduce pressure injury incidents in one of the largest randomized control trials ever conducted on patient repositioning in critical care. In this study by David Pickham, uh, more than 1,200 patients were monitored and divided into two arms. There was the um, control arm where patients wore a leaf sensor, but nurses did not receive any of the cues from the, the sensor to show when a patient required repositioning and the leaf uh, intervention arm where the system was operating normally. More than 100,000 patient care hours were analyzed in this study and the leaf arm had 73% fewer pressure injuries. Now I would like to um, introduce our guest speaker today. Um, Robin Gasparini is a um, nursing administrative specialist at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, where she's responsible for tracking progress toward the Department of Nursing Strategic Plan and other endeavors designed to elevate nursing. She has a background in quality and improvement science and has detailed knowledge of the impact that the implementation of the LEAF system has had on the facilities, pressure injury rates, and ventilator, uh, ventilator associated events. Dr. Gasparini has presented on their LEAF journey at a Magnet Conference Symposium and is currently authoring a manuscript about their experience using LEAF. Robin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, before we get started, I do just want to disclose that I am a paid consultant for Smith & Nephew, but the findings in this study are strictly um, informational. They're our findings uh, based on our use of, of this device, and they're solely intended to be for educational purposes. Um, so I uh, am at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, as Anne-Marie said, uh, in Florida, and uh, we are a 304-bed hospital uh, that's magnet designated. Um, we opened in 2008, and we've been in numerous, uh, you know, um, reports for U.S. and News and World Report has ranked uh, quite high for various specialties um, for the care that we provide. And being Mayo Clinic, uh, you know, we take pride in the care that we provide to our patients. Uh, but as many of us do, we review our quality metrics on a fairly routine cadence and had noticed that our pressure injuries were, were quite high. Um, and on review in comparison with like hospitals, we recognized uh, that our, our pressure injury use were almost twice as high as, um, you know, like hospitals according to the Indian QI database. So we wanted to do a deeper dive and really understand what the drivers were behind this. 
Um, like many of you, when you see pressure injuries uh, in your uh, ICU or, or unit, uh, you do a case study, right? You do a deeper dive. Maybe we do some chart audits to identify what some of those root causes are. And our documentation really didn't lead us to believe that, um, that, that we were turning our patients or if we were turning our patients, that it was that it was documented in a way that we really understood that we were doing everything that we could to prevent our pressure injuries. So on deeper uh, investigation, we identified the LEAF patient monitoring system as a, as a potential intervention to help support our staff and patient outcomes. Um, and initially uh, I, was, I was excited because this was an innovative way that we could address our um, hospital acquired infections, um, support staff, and you know have better outcomes for our patients. Uh, it was a tool that we could um, leverage to enhance our communication. So, uh, you know, instead of having to report or document each intervention and when that was due, um, the the system would allow for a visual of. Uh, indication to our entire care team so that we could work more collaboratively to support our care needs. Um, and by investing in a technology like this, it really helped emphasize that this, um, you know, hospital acquired pressure injury prevention was a priority for our organization. So on our pilot, we decided to, uh, to measure a few things to demonstrate true effectiveness of the device. Uh, we wanted to improve our turning adherence. Like I said, looking at documentation, we felt like um, there was a, a gap in the care that we were providing. Um, we wanted to reduce our overall pressure injuries, of course, and, and specifically looking at those pressure injuries that were uh, sacral related. We also know that uh, early mobility has positive outcomes on a number of different clinical indicators for our patients to include length of stay, GI mobility, um, and, and other uh, lung and respiratory intervention. So we thought, well, let's see you know, if this has any impact on our ventilator associated events, as this was another area that we were really trying to impact in our ICUs. Um, and then uh, lastly, Anytime that you make a decision uh, about you know, workflows, we wanted to really understand that impact and, and how it um, affected our wound care team. So we were looking at the number of wound care consults that we had that weren't driven by a grading score. So before we got started, we really did a deep dive to evaluate all of the different criteria that we felt contributed to the hospital acquired pressure injuries we had in our care unit over the last year. Um, and really what we found was uh, evidence of what was in the literature about what makes a patient a high risk for developing a pressure injury. So we took that criteria um, and, and applied it here as um, a deciding factor about who would receive the leaf therapy and care. So not uh, designated for every patient in our ICU, but those that we identified based on a set criteria. So what did we find? We were able to monitor 105 unique patients and monitor them for over 11,000 care hours. Through this, we were able to uh, see that our turning adherence um, had really improved. So we we estimated that our turning adherence was about, uh, you know, 52% per uh, the literature, the studies that Anne Marie had reviewed. When we took that and compared it to our current, um, we identified that um, that we had much improved turning adherence. Uh, we also noted that we had more equalized distribution of our turning, um, you know. Uh, equalized distribution of turning. So at baseline, we saw um, our patients uh, having um, been on their back more than on their lateral sides, but through this device, we were able to see a more equalized distribution of those turning positions. Um, we were able to do this without any other uh, incremental staff or FTE staff hired to help support um, you know, this initiative. Most importantly, we were able to reduce our pressure injuries by 67%. Um, this rate increase was significant for our care team. 
we did identify seven patients who developed a pressure injury uh, who had was um, during our pilot period. Three of those patients uh, were never identified as a candidate for the LEAF therapy. The other four had some significant uh, gaps with their turning that were noted. Um, so important here is that patients who received the LEAF therapy um, and also received the prescribed amount of turning uh, remained 100% free of our pressure injuries. When we took a look at our ventilator associated events, um, we, were, we were quite surprised to see that 92% of patients who received sleep therapy uh, remained free of a VAE. Um, now again, we know that there is a lot of um, a relationship between early mobility and other healthcare outcomes. So this isn't a direct causal link, but one that we really wanted to investigate further. We're, we're pleased to see as an outcome for our patients. And then lastly, the impact on our wound care team. So uh, we were quite surprised to see that we missed the mark here. We were hoping to decrease our wound care consults that weren't triggered by a pressure injury or a brain score. And what we found was that the team was much more aware of patients' risk. Um, and we actually increased our consults by 87%. When we looked at the reason why uh, these, these consults were generated, it really demonstrated the higher level of acuity that we were seeing in our patients um, related to their uh, pressure, current pressure injuries or skin conditions um, that we wanted to help um, protect. So uh, really strong kudos to our team uh, with this great awareness. In partnership with our wound care team, I think that was really important um, as they partnered with those specialists to identify who might be uh, at most risk and would be a great candidate for this tool. So um, in our three month uh, pilot, uh, we were able to uh, spend about $25,000 on, on our sensors. And with a 67% rate reduction, what we know is that uh, our return on investment for just this period was over half a million dollars. So if we go back and apply this to our pressure injuries for that year or what we perceived we would uh, have occurred uh, based on current data, um, we anticipated a, a house-wide return on investment of over $3.4 million. So very significant return on investment for our organization. So as with any new pilot, we had a few lessons learned. Uh, being Mayo Clinic, we wanted to be uh, particularly aggressive with our turn angles. Um, so as we've already learned with this device, not only does it um, monitor uh, when a patient needs to be turned and monitor that frequency, uh, but it's really looking for those quality turns. Um, so we identified a turn angle that was above the manufacturer recommendation uh, because we wanted to overachieve uh, in that area. And what we found is it really created some discomfort in our patients and then distrust with the validity of the data with our staff. So we were quickly able to reset that back to the manufacturer recommendations, um, which really helped, helped our team. In addition, we know that the, uh, the pillows that we have for patients uh, that are filled with air that we shove under their shoulders are not adequate for quality turning. Um, so uh, our, our team invested in wedges for all of our, our staff. Um, and we not only had wedges that, st that staff could order, but we made sure that they were in supply um, on the unit so that they were easily accessible for our team to set our staff up for success. Um, as many of you probably can relate to, ICU nurses are not always at the nurse's station. So we found that having the visual monitors at those stations wasn't necessarily the best placement for queuing um, in the need of a turn. So we were able to uh, provide software on all of our computers, um, both at the bedside and alcoves where nurses document, so that that pop-up screen is always minimized and available uh, for, for staff to see to help increase the visibility of that need. Um, and that was, that was truly uh, a key to our success with the pilot. Um, 
staff appreciated the investment in the tool, um, but initially I have to say that it was pretty difficult for the team to uh, hear that something such as fun fundamental is, is turning um, is something that we weren't very good at, right? So we had to provide a lot of education, not around the system or the, the leaf itself, but about what a quality turn really looks like and how we offload a patient's um, sacral area by really turning or, or moving that center of gravity for our patients. Um, that's something that that's a difficult message to hear for seasoned nurses who've been turning patients for a really long time. So something very sensitive to navigate with our teams um, about how we, we've just enculturated turning in a way that's not always as adequate as it could be. So that was where the majority of our education was funneled. Um, and then our leadership team made a decision not to share daily impact reports that the system provides to us indicating what each day's turning compliance looked like. Um, our team was a little bit fearful that the tool would be used uh, as um, an accountability tool. Um, and so we opted not to share that and hopes to partner with our team to share that this was a, a positive tool and really meant to enhance outcomes. Um, so in summary, we felt like our pilot was significantly successful. Um, we were able to improve our turning adherence, thereby uh, reducing rates of hospitalized pressure injuries by 67%. Um, we also noted some improvements in our ventilator associated event rates that we hope to investigate further. Um, and then we really saw a stronger partnership between our staff and our wound care consultants, um, especially as they identified the appropriate patients to receive this therapy. Um, our next steps include uh, trying to help improve documentation. So we're building epic um, flow sheet uh, integrations with the system that will help uh, indicate the patient's position and set our teams up for success when they're documenting. Um, and of course, we were able to use uh, this quality improvement project uh, to help us with our accrediting bodies and things like um, our magnet redesignation to support, uh, to support nurse-led initiatives. Well, thank you, Robin, so much for that presentation. That's really interesting stuff. So we have some uh, questions here. Um, can you tell us what you have done since the pilot ended? And have you been able to maintain the results in pressure injury reduction? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we, we have been able to maintain some of our results. Um, we felt the pilot was so successful um, that on review, we had other areas uh, outside of our ICU that we felt could really benefit from leveraging this tool. Um, so to date, we have expanded uh, beyond our ICUs to include our progressive care area and uh, four of our um, uh, general care areas to include, uh, you know, neuro, general care, um, and pulmonary. And we hope to expand this in the next coming months to our cardiac areas as well. Um, we did note that through COVID, we had some slippage of our results. And so we've done a deep dive to look at uh, where we could be successful. And what we found is that we were applying our sensors to patients um, a little bit later than we needed to. Uh, so we have done a deep dive into our application criteria in partnership with our wound care team and now have very set criteria whereby staff um, place the sensor. Whereas the criteria previously was a little bit more gray and left a lot of room for interpretation. And what we have found is that this has helped us be very, very successful. Um, so, uh, to date, we, we are pleased to share that we are able to maintain that lower number of pressure injuries in our organization and not have pressure injuries uh, with patients to receive leaf therapy. That's great to hear. Um, what do you think were some of your biggest learnings from the pilot? Mm. Um, it was really important for us to apply a change management approach to this device. Um, the device uh, is, is very easy to use. It's um, very intuitive. But like I said, staff really struggled with the fact that we were investing in something to help them turn their patients um, because turning is something that we perceive that we're doing very well. 
So our biggest struggle was overcoming the culture that our patients were either too sick to turn or that we were turning the prescribed amount of therapy. Um, so initially after implementation, staff felt like the leaf sensor almost uh, increased their, their workload. Um, but we were able to identify um, after only a, a few weeks that the workload hadn't been increased, but rather it held us accountable to what we needed to be doing and what we thought we were doing. And it was able to cue us in a way that was um, very sensitive to our needs. What sets this device apart from other devices is that it's not um, a timer. Uh, it's actually monitoring that patient's center of gravity. And if you apply an early nursing intervention, um, if the patient needs to be changed or pulled up in the bed, it allows for that time and credits that time back to the patient. So if the system is alerting that a turn is due, then it's only in learning, alerting the team um, if that turn is required for reperfusion, um, not, not in a way that's a timer uh, like most systems are. So um, I think that was our, our biggest challenge to overcome. And um, the results that we were able to share on a monthly basis with our team really helped us drive home that message of, you know, there was, you know, we had this perception that we were doing everything we could, but what we identified is this tool helped us um, provide the best care that we could possibly provide and demonstrate better outcomes for our patients. That's great. Now, you talked earlier a little bit about kind of the steps that you took to look at, do a deep dive on patient risk for your monitoring criteria. Can you talk a little bit more about that and kind of some of the modifications to that criteria that you did since then? Absolutely. Um, so like many organizations, every, uh, every hospital acquired event uh, receives a, a review. And in our case, uh, we have a team that looks at every hospital acquired pressure injury um, and what we were finding is if the leaf um, was in place, we were looking at things uh, such as when was the, the leaf placed, um, how early was it placed, uh, what potential factors do we think uh, you know, contributed to that patient's development of that injury. Um, and what we were finding is that uh, the leaf was being applied about 48 hours or later into the patient's stay into ICU. And at first, that was an intentional ask of our team, uh, an effort to try to um, reduce the number of sensors uh, that we were using or, or really make sure we were maximizing that benefit. We wanted to apply that sensor to patients that we felt like would stay in the ICU for a greater period um, of time so that they could really get the, the use out of the tool. What we found is that uh, nobody wants to really look in that crystal ball and identify the time frame that that patient's going to be uh, in their care. So um, we also uh, were able to provide this infrastructure and tool across many areas of our hospital, uh, which meant that we were able to provide continuity of care with the tool, even if the patient was discharged from our ICU into another area. So we removed from our application criteria the, the requirement that a patient needed to be in the ICU for 48 hours. Um, another piece of our uh, criteria that, that we looked at um, was nurse's discretion. So a nurse had the discretion to apply the sensor based on, on need. And what we found is that staff uh, really struggled with some of that gray area and really preferred for us to um, speak with them about, this is probably a good candidate, we should do it. And so we've removed a lot of that gray area to help one, reduce some of the wound care consults that we were getting for application um, and, and really have the nurses think about the Braden score. And at a set level, if, if that Braden score is below a certain number, then that patient is automatically a candidate regardless of the trajectory of their stay. Um, what we found is that that has really helped us um, improve our adherence uh, to um, the LEAF application when it's most needed, um, which is in that early phase of care for our patients. That's great. Um, Robin, can you kind of take us back to the time when you were just sort of um, 
you know, trying to get the approval for implementing this for your pilot. How did you justify the cost to your nursing leadership? This is a question that a lot of a lot of people in different facilities want to know. Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, so we're very fortunate at at Mayo that we had funds to support um, innovation grants. Um, but in 2018, this pilot came before that innovation funding was available to us. So it really took a multidisciplinary view um, of the tool um, to, to share it across our leadership team. So we needed our buy-in, not only from our quality team and our CNS team and our staff, um, but from our nurse administrators and our providers um, you know, for the tool. We were able to demonstrate that we were missing information um, in our medical record, right? So this wasn't just, um, you know, when we did audits of, of where, where was the problem and what could we do to fix it, there wasn't a lot of information available to us from within our own internal investigation. And if we turn to the evidence, we recognize that um, there's lots of opportunity in things that we, we perceive we're doing, right? Particularly around turning. And so understanding the evidence, understanding how patients um, are or aren't manipulated uh, during their care, and then understanding our own internal culture of patients being too sick to turn and the strategies that we really needed to embrace to combat hemodynamic instability were all things that um, our leaders were really interested in. And, and um, I do believe that, you know, particularly with our pilot, the investment up front was, was rather minimal, right? So there was a lot of time and planning on the part of our team um, that we were able to do, but the costs of the equipment um, are all part of, of the contract that we were able to get um, to provide the care. So really, we were only looking at the cost of the sensors, which can easily be um, kind of assumed at the unit level. Um, so it was a very easy sell for us uh, is when we looked at our data and looked at what our perceptions were internally and then looked at the, the evidence outside of our organization. It made a lot of sense to our quality improvement team to track these metrics. That's great. All right. So I have some product questions here as well. I figured maybe you and I could tag team these as needed. Um, I have a question here about, can this device be used in the prone position? Um, basically the answer to that is yes, the leap sensor also detects uh, proning as well. So it can be used for that. Um, Robin, have you guys used the leaf um, for your prone patients at all? We have used the device um, for patients in prone. Um, so the device is unique enough that it's able to monitor uh, various patient positions. So it can indicate if a patient's in prone. Um, it can also help with patients who are out of bed to chair or sitting upright. So it monitors not only turn angles, but tilt angles and positioning. So it really is an early mobility tool. Um, uh, in addition to prone and uh, other angles, the system can actually indicate if a person is uh, ambulating in the hallway. Um, and so you can track over time those different positions or, or ambulation schedules um, with your patient. Great. Um, I have another question here. How long does the battery last? And what I can say is our instructions for you say up to 16 days. What kind of battery life are you seeing at your facility, Robin? So I know it kind of varies. It's like your cell phone. If you use it a lot, it you know it tends to last less. If you don't use it, if you don't have a patient who's very mobile, like critical care, it tends to last longer. But what are you seeing? Uh, we have seen the device last uh, a little bit longer uh, than the 16 days. Um, we've also seen it last about that. So I think to your point, it, it does matter um, how much you're using it. So in our isolation rooms, um, the device uh, does allow you to tap it and see if you're in a quality position before you leave that patient's bedside. So you don't have to don or doff your gear again to go back in and, and help uh, with the patient. And so that would help. Um, you know, you know, keep it to that more 16 day range. We also have these uh, the visualiz visualization monitors in each room. So uh, we don't necessarily have to rely on the device itself to tell us that. So it depends on the nursing preference and how that device is used. We have seen it uh, last up to 
uh, just under a, a month mark. That's great. So uh, this is a question that pops up periodically. Can leave be used against the institution in litigation? So my answer kind of on that is it's doing a couple of things. It's really is increasing the frequency and quality of repositioning in the institution. It's also uh, adding a lot of documentation about the repositioning. And um, oftentimes litigation, you know, it, it goes against um, the, the institution when there isn't enough documentation about repositioning. Um, what are your views on that, Robin? Mm. That's a great question. Um, so the the device, to your your point, does track a lot of data, and I think it can be very useful in a case where um, you could indicate that a pressure injury was completely unavoidable, um, that everything that you could do to prevent that injury uh, was done, and that that turning documentation is there. That said, our organization opted not to have this information readily available or attached to the chart. Um, we only use uh, those reports on deep dive when we're trying to further in investigate a particular uh, patient or event. Um, so my recommendation there would be to partner with your legal team, partner with somebody from risk to identify um, how you want to do that moving forward. Um, it's, it's definitely supportive documentation, but not something that would be required on daily use. Um, where I find the tool to be most helpful is, is we investigate um, documentation into our flow sheet, um, the device will indicate uh, what position the patient is in. So the nurse can easily go in and validate those positions and indicate that those movements had changed or that that turning had occurred. Um, and, and that's where I find it to be most useful as we try to, um, you know, improve our documentation around the interventions that we provide. I guess that dovetails uh perfectly to the next question, which is, does this technology automatically document in EPIC? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, um, it can. And so we are uh, actively building those interfaces so that that, that can work for us. Um, and we're very excited uh, to see this come to fruition. Fantastic. All right, one last question. What would you recommend for facilities that do not have this technology? Yeah. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, a, a true um, reflection of current practices is probably in order, right? So we think that we're turning our patients on a routine cadence. Um, is that routine cadence adequate? Is it enough? When do we know our patients need to be reperfused? And then how do we monitor the quality of those turns? Uh, what we found with this device, we're turning uh, to the prescribed uh, amount of turning, and that our turns weren't even adequate to reperfuse our patients. Um, so, you know, looking at frequency, looking at quality, those are things that I would encourage you to investigate, you know, in your areas at a deep level and see how you can monitor and track that over time. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Robin. Thank you everybody for attending our Sunrise session. Please go ahead and uh, scan this code to take our COVID-19 pandemic pressure injury survey. And we hope that everybody has a great rest of the conference.